All right, if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 2. See if we can follow up the kids doing that here. Thankfully, it's the Word of God, uh, so that's a good thing. So Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 21, and we'll read through verse 40. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses... They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. The sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up to that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you knowing that we need your assistance. We need your spirit to be at work in our hearts and in our minds. As I proclaim your word, as we all hear it, Lord, open eyes and ears, soften hearts, unite our hearts to fear your name. May we see the beauty and the glory of this text. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. Lord, we pray this for your glory and for our good and joy. In Christ's name, amen. Well, and I think it's in almost all well-written and entertaining stories, you find conflict. There has to be some sort of conflict, and it's felt through and experienced uh, uh, in the characters as they struggle with finding hope in the midst of times that quite often seem very bleak. Maybe you could think of a, a recent trilogy like The Hunger Games, or in one with a bit more legacy, The Lord of the Rings, which I just found out. It's 20 years since the first movie was released. Uh, it's been tr- that's kind of hard to imagine. It's been 20 years since that first movie. But in those, we see this conflict quite easily. In particular, in Tolkien's second book, The Two Towers, we see three men, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, pursuing a group of what's known as uruk High, who have taken their friends Merry and Pippin captive. And during the pursuit, they come upon these riders of Rohan led by Aemir, and it's, it's not a friendly welcome at all. Uh, they surround them, and, and it's, a, it's a little tense for a moment, but they remind that they are actually friends of Rohan. But Aramor responds that as they say that they're, they're pursuing this group of Uruks, that those Uruks were slaughtered in the night, that not one was left alive. It's actually a depressing moment in the story. And though these three pursuers are given horses for their pursuit, which seems futile at this time, they do pursue, or they do continue. But just before the riders of Rohan take leave, Aomer says to them this line, look for your friends, but do not trust to hope. It has forsaken these lands. 
In bleak times, that's what we feel, isn't it? Like all is lost, like hope is, is gone, that it's forsaken the land. It's dark and depressing. The walls seem to be closing in on us, and there's little in the way of peace. And I think much of the world has felt that since March of 2020, and there's still fear and worry as things in certain areas, it's, is it ramping up, is it not? And, but it's not just over COVID. Maybe we feel it over the economy and inflation or the ambitions and rise of China and Russia and even Iran, or, or pretty locally over tragedies like the tornado in the Mid-South. Or sometimes it's just simply with the circumstances of our lives. It's not always like that, and hopefully for most of us, that's not the predominant feeling. But I, I, I think we all know what it's like to feel that to some degree. And life probably didn't feel much different for those in Israel around the time of the birth of Jesus. This, this was not a high point in Israel's history. There was little trust, there was little love, there was little faith, even little true obedience. The nation was under Roman rule. No revelation had been heard from God for 400 years. There's been silence. And it's been a bit of a dismal reality. But hope wasn't lost. In fact, it was coming to fruition. For years, faithful Israelites had trusted in the promise of the Messiah to come to redeem them, to free them. They had read words like those of Psalm 111, verse 9, and they knew the Lord to be faithful, where it says He sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is He. And they longed to see the truth of those words. They longed to see that redemption that the Lord would send. They longed to, to hear the command of the Lord saying, I will keep my covenant. And hope had to be placed there. It had to be placed in God and in His covenant, in His word, even through times when the, the nation as a whole seemed to forsake any hope in God, when the drift from covenant faithfulness seemed to be so strong where the nation was placing their hope very much in the wrong place. Even in those times, there were still those who remained faithful, who continued to trust, who continued to hope and to wait for the consolation of Israel. And I think we experience much the same today. And in our text this morning, what is known as the Nunc Dimittis, which is, is really the first words of the Latin Vulgate of Simeon's song, which basically translates as, now you're letting your servant depart. And in this, though, we see those who continued to trust, those who sought to follow and be assured by God's Word the text builds as we read through it, as it works from Joseph and Mary taking Jesus to the temple to Simeon and his beautiful song of relief and praise that arose because of actual met expectations, expectations of hope that had been realized. This is what we are reminded of during Advent, folks, the hope that came and the hope that is coming again in full without doubt. So much of this text focuses on God's Word, hoping in Him and His promise and, and His direction. We first see Mary and Joseph obeying God's Word, and then we will see the hope that comes from believing and resting and trusting in God's Word. So we come to the point where the time has come. Eight days have passed and Mary and Joseph follow the pattern laid out in God's Word, laid out in His law, and they seek to be faithful to God's instruction. The time has come for the baby to be circumcised and to be called Jesus. Now, circumcision. This was the sign of the covenant for the people of Israel. It set the one who was circumcised apart. It showed him to be in God's covenant community. And by that, it signified the removal of sinful flesh. Now, with that being said, why would Jesus undergo circumcision? He was not born in sin. He was not a sinner. Yes, he was born of a woman, but he was miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit and born in complete perfection. 
So why be circumcised? Well, he was circumcised to fulfill the law of God. Genesis 17, 11 to 14 makes it clear that every male child is to be circumcised as the sign of the covenant, and without it, that child shall be cut off from God's people because he has broken covenant. So Christ was circumcised. He fulfilled that aspect of God's covenant, but not only that part of God's covenant, but God's covenant in every detail. And without this, without him fulfilling it all, he would not have been truly innocent, the unblemished, the perfect lamb of God that could take his people's sin upon himself. And now the rite itself, it signifies, as I said, the removal of sin. But with Christ, it's a greater picture. It's a picture of, um, a very early picture of his full obedience. Even unto blood, Matthew Henry wrote, Then he shed his blood by drops, which afterward he poured out in purple streams. It's a picture of the cross. But folks, there is much more to this fulfillment. By coming in this way, Jesus identified with us. He was brought into the family of God, even though he had always been the beloved son. And even though it assumes that the child is a sinner, where that sin is cut away symbolically, Jesus had no impurity, no sin to cut off, but he did so. And as he did, the eternal God, as the eternal God, he submitted to this to be made in the likeness of sinful flesh to be made like us in every way, to identify fully with those he came to redeem. It was all done in order to justify, to, to save sinners. And as the seed of Abraham, he would be the one to remove the stain of sin by giving his flesh, by giving his very life. And as we already read, he was given the name Jesus the name his parents were given by the angel, the, the name that meant that he would save his people from their sins. It was a fairly common name, actually. But that doesn't take away from the beauty and the sweetness of the sound of that name. It reminds me, some of you will probably be thinking of the same thing, a song by Bill and Gloria Gaither. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. The name, actually, along with that, it has a heroic nature to it. The name is the same as Joshua, the great leader and deliverer of Israel, the one who led the people into the promised land, and Jesus himself will lead his people into the eternal land of promise, the land of realized hope, the land of comfort, the land of no more pain or heartache or darkness. Well, he was circumcised, and then after another 32 days passed, it was time for the purification the law of Moses stipulated this in Leviticus 12, that the mother of a boy was counted unclean for 40 days past birth, and that at the end of that time period, a lamb, or if you were poor, which is true of Mary and Joseph, a pigeon or a turtle dove, was to be sacrificed for a burnt offering, as well as one for a sin offering. And Joseph and Mary followed this completely, presented Jesus at the temple. Again, it is all done in order to fulfill the law of God, to remove any occasion of offense our complaint against Jesus. He must perfectly fulfill and obey the law of God. Now, from the very moment of birth, Jesus willingly submitted to the law of God. That's why he came. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And by his fulfilling the law, he could be our substitute our unblemished sacrifice in order to redeem his people, to buy us back, not just then, but throughout his life, he consistently and flawlessly showed himself to be the perfect redeemer. And remember what the pious Jew had been hoping for and of which the prophets spoke. And so now we see these two shining examples of the hope of the pious, of the hope of the true Jew waiting and longing for this Messiah to come. Look at verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, 
And this man was righteous and devout. So Simeon was a Jew. He was a Jew who loved the Lord. He loved God's people. He dealt uprightly with both God and man. He was described as one who was waiting for something very specific. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He knew the promise of God to to comfort, to bring relief, to bring lasting hope. He, He certainly knew the words of Isaiah in chapter 40 and 49. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. The Lord The Lord is our comforter. And so Simeon rested in that truth. The Lord comforts and has compassion. Simeon was a man of remarkable spiritual health. He was a man who had hope in a place where hope had been forsaken. Where Roman rule was strong and the nation had not heard from God. No, this was not a great time for Israel. Conditions are not all well and peaceful. Yet, through all of that, Simeon's expectant. He's hopeful. He's not hanging his head low, staring at the ground, distraught over the condition of Israel. I thought about this. Perhaps he's the precursor to a person named Nellie Forbush. Some of you will know that name from the musical South Pacific. She was called a cockeyed optimist, remember? Remember? She was a cockeyed optimist because she had this great anticipation during the war of everything getting better. This, this, uh, she, she just knew it. And, and Simeon had that same kind of cockeyed optimism, but founded in real hope. You know, having that kind of optimism is certainly not a bad thing. Certainly not a bad thing when it's founded on God's Word. Simeon's not seeking comfort and consolation anywhere, but in the Lord. He is righteous and devout. He's looking to God, not to circumstances, not to everything else around him, but to God with expectation and with hope. Came across this from John Calvin in his Institutes. He wrote, Such is pure and genuine religion, namely confidence in God coupled with serious fear or serious reverence. And I think that describes Simeon, worshipful and reverent, confident in his hope in God. He's like the watchman who waits for the morning, for the sunrise to come, knowing that however bleak the night may be, morning will come. One of my favorite psalms is one that we did not too long ago this summer. It's Psalm 130, and I'd encourage you to flip there with me. Psalm 130. Okay, I'm going to guess that most of that was electronic because I didn't hear a whole lot of papers moving. So, Psalm 130. There we go. I'm hearing some. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. You can see right away where the psalmist is going. He's going to the Lord. And he says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities." Because I think Simeon's heart is a reflection of this psalm. Simeon's uh, nature, Simeon's uh, expectation. uh, Verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Or verse 7, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Just think about that last phrase, plentiful redemption. It's not just a smidgen of redemption. It's not just enough redemption to get by. It's not rationed redemption. It's plentiful redemption. Because that's who our God is. This is what Simeon had been waiting for. He'd been trusting in. And at some point it had been revealed to him, this had been amazing, that he would not die 
until he had the privilege of seeing the Lord's Christ. So he's in the midst of this 400 years of silence, dark times in Israel, and the Holy Spirit reveals to him, Simeon, you won't die. Your eyes will not close until you see the Lord's Christ. I'd, I'd be waking up every day wondering, is today the day? Is today the day? Is today the day? And it's on this day that he comes to the temple. He's led by the Spirit, and he sees Joseph and Mary bringing the child Jesus. I wish the dialogue had been recorded by Luke. But I can imagine it going something like this. He just kind of goes up, quiet. Joseph, Mary, my name's Simeon. And our God promised me that I would not taste death until I laid my eyes on the promised Messiah. And that child in your arms, that's him. Could I please hold him? Could I take him in my arms? I can just imagine that conversation. And, and what would you have done if you were Joseph and Mary? I mean, they, they, they knew that Jesus was special. They, they had heard so much. But I still think this might have been a little bit startling. But even being startled, they allow Simeon to take baby Jesus up in his arms. And as he does, his heart sings. And he blesses God. He just says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Just try, just try to grasp, grasp the, the depths of the emotion that Simeon must have felt in that moment. I don't know how long he had been waiting, how long it had been that the Spirit had told him, you will not die until this happens. But that emotion must have come out. He'd been trusting in, in the promise of the Lord. He waited with great expectancy to see the promised one. And now not only has he seen the promised one, but he's actually held his own Savior in his arms. His first words are of both praise and, I think, relief. They essentially communicate, God, you have been so faithful. Now I can depart. Now I can close my eyes and be with you forever because you've allowed me to gaze upon my Savior. His words are astounding. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Folks, as much as this was a fairly ordinary birth that happened in what we would probably call a podunk town of Bethlehem, it wasn't hidden. And it wasn't just for Israel. It was for all peoples. God sent his son in order to save people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He was and is the consolation, the comfort, the, the only hope of a ruined and fallen and sinful and broken world. His light for those in darkness. Every day we could hear Isaiah 9 2, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. The birth of Christ is the sunrise the watchmen waited for. He's the glory of Israel. What better glory could a people have than the Savior of the humble, the Savior of the world? If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand but with you? There is forgiveness of sins because of this baby born in Bethlehem. Folks, that's what the world needs. We need the forgiveness of God and the, the peace that comes with that. It only comes through the Savior, through the Lord's Christ. It is with him that there is hope, that, that there is forgiveness, that there is consolation. 
But yet, sadly, that consolation is not felt by all, is it? Because for many, Jesus is a stone of stumbling, the place where the pride of man falls headlong. Simeon said to Mary, verse 34, that he's appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Jesus comes to and for the humble, to those who know their need of them, of him who, who know that if their sin were counted against them, they could not stand, that their only hope is in God working to save them, and he exposes the very depths of our hearts. We're all naked and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. But those words that Simeon said there, they also speak to the very real fact that the life of the Messiah will not be an easy one. And that actually the life of his mother won't be easy either. That a sword will pierce her own soul also. Because Jesus will be opposed, there will be great pain. There will be a cross before a crown. See, Jesus is the key to all human destiny. How you respond to him, to the Lord's Christ, your relationship to him will determine everything. Simeon was the ideal Israelite waiting for the Lord, but there was another. There's Anna, this aged woman. Um, she was either, depending on how you read the creek there, she's either 84 or 105. And she was a devout woman. And she worshiped at the temple consistently with fasting and prayer. And at the very hour when Jesus was brought to the temple, verse 38, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. There, there, was, there, there was no, you know, doing what a lot of people do at churches is try and sneak in the back and sneak back out before anybody sees him. Because here are Mary and Joseph, and here's Anna proclaiming to everybody about the little baby in their arms. She's proclaiming the gospel. She proclaimed the Messiah. She proclaimed him to all who were waiting, all waiting on God, waiting on his time with anticipation. And that's, folks, where this whole passage pushes us, to waiting on God with expectant hope, trusting in him, trusting in his word. Folks, we are to be expectant believers. The cockeyed optimist and not the Eeyore. Hungry and thirsty for the blessing and working of God. We're to be steadfast and immovable in our trust, even in the midst of dark days. So where is your hope? Where do you often seek consolation? Folks, we are all in a better position and more clear position than Simeon. Yes, he had the Holy Spirit telling him, you, you won't die until you see the Lord's Christ. We have the testimony of it. We have an empty tomb. We have the, the more full revelation. Simeon waited for this day to arrive. It's already come for us. We can see the faithfulness of God more and more clearly. We see it through the entire life of Christ, his Life, his birth, his, birth, his life, his, his, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And therefore, we wait with expectant hope for his return, his second advent to set all things right. J.C. Ryle, a great Anglican bishop, wrote of Simeon, he said, He speaks like one for whom the grave has lost its terrors and the world its charms. How's that true? because of his hope, because of his God. He knew where true satisfaction and true hope resided in the midst of a world and a life that is often broken and hurting and painful and dark and dismal. He placed his trust fully in God and in his promise. So folks, this text is for all who are waiting desperately for consolation. Advent. Advent is a time of hope. 
It's a time we look for the, the true consolation when we look not only to the first advent, but we look with expectant hope to Christ's second advent. He's the one who will set all things right. This baby born in a manger, this child, baby brought to the temple, the baby who grew in wisdom and stature, this child who became a man who ministered perfectly for three years and was crucified as a common criminal in utter disgrace on our behalf so that we could know life and forgiveness and hope and peace. He's the one we are waiting for with expectant hope. The one who is worthy to be waited upon, to be praised, to be looked to. So this Advent season, there's not much time left in it, but that's okay. Redirect your eyes and your heart more and more to the solid expectant hope. Be that watchman waiting for the morning, for the, the, the sure promise, the steadfast love of God that's displayed completely, utterly perfect in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this word and pray that you would strengthen us that you would give us greater hope and greater peace, that we would know your love more than we know anything else, that we would rest in the steadfast love and the covenant promise of our Lord. Father, give your grace and your peace to us, even as we sing of that expectant hope of his coming again. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.